Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. Tiffany over in Rome, Katie in Seattle. And Tiffany, I'm going to toss today's topic over to you. What do you want to talk about? Well, I came across a quote today, and I actually put it up on our Instagram account uh, as we're taping this, of course, so it might be a week or so ago if you're, if you're listening. But the quote was, in the depth of winter, I finally learned that within me lay an invincible summer, Albert Camus. Yes, very nice. Have you heard that quote before? Has, is that one of the ones you found? I Because I have this list of quotes, this great <laughs> list of quotes that I add to constantly and I draw from constantly. And I saw that on there and I'm like, did I put this on there? Did Katie? Because I think it's like a shared file between us. Like, did Katie put this on here? This is such a great quote. I'm guessing, and it is such a hopeful quote. Yes, um, yes, it is. I, it, I'm guessing it's me because I used to have that above my desk. Okay. So I want to hear about why you like that quote enough to put it above your desk. But um, yeah, mm. go ahead and answer me that first, because I have some thoughts about it and some other thoughts. I think that it is a very romantic quote. You know, it's a very hopeful quote in the sense that it kind of harkens, at least to me, that within you is a wellspring of creativity and thought, if only you are able to tap into it and even in the darkest time that that wellspring is still there and that sometimes Mm -hmm. it takes that darkest time to rediscover in a way that there are these things in yourself that can create beauty out of a deep darkness or sadness or depression or loss or whatever it is that this invincible summer still lives within you I don't know that's me riffing off the top of my head without knowing that you were going to say that (laughs) <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, no, because it, it, I find it a very hopeful and a beautiful quote uh, for those same reasons. But as I really sat and thought about it, I was like, okay, there's only one problem with this quote. I don't actually like summer. Um, <laughs> and that's not really true. I say that. Like, that's something that I say. I say it to shock Italians. You know, I'll be like, I hate summer. And they look at me like I've just said, you know, like I hate my mother or something. <laughs> Because Italians love summer. It's just like they all live for summer. And I mean, part of that is probably because they get such generous summer vacations. Yeah. The way that kids love summer. When you're a kid, you can't help but love summer because you get, you're get you off of school, right? So it's maybe the same sort of mentality. And mm. I grew up adoring summer. And, you know, we grew up in the same place. And we know what summer is like in Seattle. And it is often just... I mean, so much more beautiful than the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. Um, So much more enjoyable than the rest of the year. I mean, the weather is not always great, but it's often great. It's going to be greater in summer than it is any other time of year. Mm -hmm. Um, So I grew up adoring summer, but now I dread summer. I truly Mm -hmm. dread it. Being in the city in the summer, there might be some fun times. There might be some, you know, nights out with friends or, mm-hmm. you know, beach days and stuff. But for the most part, I just like, I just try to get it over with. I totally understand that because if someone's listening who has never been to Rome in the summer, I mean, it is, let's be frank, yeah. swelteringly hot with very few places yeah. with any kind of air conditioning whatsoever. I've never actually spent a July in Rome because by the time I got to like, <laughs> the end of June, I couldn't possibly stand more. It is just so humid and so hot that, yeah, I totally get it. I mean, it is kind of the opposite of what we think of it with the Seattle summer, which is you can get outside and not wear a jacket and it's perfectly comfortable into the evening. You know, for you, it's almost like you got to, and certainly parts of the United States are the same way. It's like, you got to be inside more because outside it's just too much. It's like living on the surface of the sun. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I'm very, very, I consider myself very lucky to have air conditioning in my home and I, I have the possibility to drive places I don't always have to be, you know, waiting for a bus like I I had to do for so many years there. And I have also the, the the ability to stay home if I need to stay home. You know what I mean? I don't have to be 
going out and slaving away across town, you know, because when that was my life, when I was, you know, working as a tour guide every single day and taking the bus and living in no air conditioning, it was, I mean, it was misery, really. Um, This isn't an episode about summer and how bad summer is in Rome. I'm not trying to go there. I'm just, (laughs) I just thought it's interesting how seasons, I mean, everybody has their own favorite season. You could say, except for me, Claudio always laughs because almost every single month I say at least once, oh my God, this is my favorite time of year. Mm -hmm. Um, And he says, you say that every month. (laughs) This is my favorite month. (laughs) Um, Except for obviously July and August if we're in Rome. Um, Yeah. But, you know, for the most part, everybody has their favorite time of year. Uh, but Claudio's totally right because I just said to you before we started taping, I was like, March is my favorite <laughs> month of the year. Um, but I could easily say that about September, October, April, May. I mean, I could, you know, December, uh, depending on my mood. But um, but I was thinking about March as we're taping this. It is March. And I take a walk every morning in my neighborhood. And this morning I noticed the cherry blossoms. I think they're actually plum blossoms which are very similar and sometimes hard to tell apart. Um, but I noticed them for the first time in bloom today. In Rome, the birds are out all all winter. It's not like you only see the birds in the spring. But, you know, more birds than usual. I saw some birds getting romantic today. <laughs> and there was a warmth in the air. It was the first day of the year that I had to take my jacket off while I was walking. It was too hot. And we're talking 9 a.m., you know, mm-hmm. not one o'clock. It was only 9 a.m. And I was already having to take my jacket off. And I thought to myself, this is my favorite moment of the year. <laughs> um, that moment when it's still cool, but you can feel spring in the air. Mm-hmm. And you you know that it's coming. It's that hopefulness, but it's not quite, it's not quite there yet. And th- I think that's something about me personally. And I know that I'm not the only person... I almost like the anticipation of something more than the arrival of it. That's almost more enjoyable. So I kind of savor, as much as I savor spring, I also savor the end of winter Mm -hmm. because I'm like, oh my gosh, this is that magical moment when you're like, spring's just around the corner. Yeah. And my mom used to say that to me, spring is just around the corner. And I used to imagine and like picture it, like picture turning around a corner and spring being there <laughs> um, when I was a little girl. Um, and I just love it. I just love that moment of the year. And it's funny to me because we talked about, I think it was last year, if not two years ago, I think it was last year though, we did a whole episode about how you, how depressing you find the month of March to be. Yeah. Although <laughs> it is different this year, this being the warmest year, winter on record, like historical record for a very, very long time. If not ever, I'm not sure, actually. Just in Seattle or in the whole world? No, worldwide, worldwide. This has been the most temperate winter in recent history. So here in Seattle, I mean, I went out for a walk just the other night, and it was almost balmy outside. We have the cherry blossoms are starting to bloom. We have daffodils up. The tulips are coming out. The crocuses have already been out for weeks and weeks and weeks. It's here. It's here early. And we're still getting the kind of sideways rain that can be March. So it's not like we're completely devoid of the wild weather. We've also been having insane wind and rain uh, here and there. But it's been like spotty. The worst marches in Seattle are the ones where it just tends to rain every single day or it feels like the sun never, ever comes out. It's it basically goes from various degrees of darkness outside. It gets darker and then it gets slightly less dark, you know, but it's dark the whole time. And this year yeah. has been better in that regard. But yeah, I mean, maybe for me, it's something even bigger about March. I'm not sure. It's funny, though, when you're talking about seasons, because I was thinking while you were saying it, as you know, I grew up as a little kid in Minnesota and Minnesota is a state that I think is one of the states that I lived in that truly had four seasons that seemed to march out like you would see in an elementary school calendar, where it's like fall and everything's falling, winter, snow is everywhere, spring, snow melts, flowers are coming up, summer, sun beats down, people go swimming in a lake, and it repeats again and again and again. And 
part of what it was like to move to Washington State, to move to Seattle specifically, which is more of a rainforest type area, is that I felt like I moved here and I shed the seasons. It's not that we don't have changes and variations here, but it's not as distinct as it is in the Midwest of the United States. You know, and I think in a way, Rome is sort of the same. Like both places get snow occasionally, but it's not like a given. You know what I mean? And Rome gets darker and rainier, but it never gets insanely different, at least from the time yeah. I've spent no, there. No, the seasons are not that varied. Spring and autumn can kind of feel interchangeable. I mean, obviously, there's more flowers in spring, mm -hmm. clearly. Mm -hmm. um, we don't get a lot of the changing colors in the fall. And you, you, if you go into the countryside, you can see it more. But if you're in a city, you're not going to really feel it the way you would feel it, like in a New York or a Boston. And the winter can also feel like fall. You know, mm -hmm. the winter can really feel like just a very, very long fall. And you'll get the changing colors. Sometimes you'll see them like in January. Like it, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's the still like you've got the yellow leaves on the trees in January. Yeah. And then there's just this credi incredibly ridiculously lit hot summer. It kind of feels like a very, very long fall and a very, very long summer and a very short spring mm -hmm. and no winter at all. That's it, how it feels. That's so true. It's funny actually too, because we just t did our Rome trip last year in October and we are going to do it again in October. And part of the reason we picked October is because what is October in Rome? It's like, basically the equivalent of the beautiful summer in Seattle. You know, not too hot, but not at all cold. Feels kind of balmy, but not sweaty balmy, you know? Lots of sun if we get lucky like we did last year. Kitty stepping in real quick. Yes, you heard right. This coming October from the 6th to the 12th, we are taking a group of lucky listeners with us to Rome you can be sitting in the sun of your own private courtyard inside the historic walls of a convent turned into a grand hotel. You can explore the delight of discovering an ancient site that's hidden behind a plain-looking door. You can get to know Tiffany and me personally and participate in a live taping of The Bittersweet Life, all while sipping wine in Rome's warm, perfect air while green parrots fly overhead. There is that and so much more on this trip, October 2024, the 6th through the 12th. I hope you will consider joining us. Get more info by emailing bittersweetlifepodcast at gmail.com. Again, that's bittersweetlifepodcast at gmail.com. And you don't just have to take my word for it. Here is a review of the trip that happened last year from one of our lucky people who came along. This was just such a great experience. This is the first time I've been to Europe, and everything that we saw during the tour, there was just so many new sights and so many new experiences. It just exceeded all my expectations by far, and this was just a really great experience. And yeah, if anyone else uh, has the opportunity to come and see Rome with Katie and Tiffany, then um, we should definitely keep the opportunity. And now, back to the show. Even in addition to, like, sort of having your own personal, like, where you come from and the things that influence, like, obviously you're going to like summer less if it's crazy, crazy hot mm -hmm. where you live. It's kind of normal. But, I mean, even beyond those location-heavy reasons, there are people who just, you know, who tend to prefer the winter. Mm -hmm. And there are there's a lot of people who tend to prefer the summer. So what does it say about a person who prefers that dark time uh, and who thrives on that dark time? Like I get way more work done mm -hmm. in the summer. I mean, sorry, in the winter time. <laughs> I, was gonna I, say. Get, I get very little work done in the summer. I mean, that's part of that is having a, a, a child who has like 18 weeks of summer vacation or some insane <laughs> thing like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So that's part of it. But but part of it is just the heat and you just don't feel like it. And you're just like, there's always something kind of better to do. That's another reason I love the winter. Like for me, it's the opposite of this sort of hibernation. Mm -hmm. Like you think, okay, winter time is hibernation. You, you do less, you move less, you produce less, and you just kind of rest up. But I feel like Maybe again, that's because I live here, but I feel like in the summer, that's when I'm like, I can't function. Let me just lie here 
um, <laughs> and do nothing. And in the winter, I'm much more productive. So does that mean that you prefer the winter? I'm not going to say I prefer it. Look, if I'm at a lake in the countryside, in a villa, sure, give me summer. I'd much rather have it be summer. You know, if I'm going to be in the mountains, well, of course, I'm sure the mountains are beautiful in the winter too, if you ski, which I don't at yet. But I mean, clearly it's easy to love summer if you're on vacation. But I guess I'm talking about like regular life. Yeah. It's funny because Seattle has its own, the people who live here, live here for very distinctive reasons, I think. Of course, yeah, some of it's family and habit, and this is where you grew up. But there's a lot of people, I know a lot of people in Seattle who look forward to the winter because they want to go skiing. And that is a very common thing to encounter here. If you threw a dart into a crowd, you know, you'd probably hit a person that was like, yeah, winter for skiing, please. You know, And I'm talking like you'd hit right. that person a thousand times. All of those people feel the same <laughs> way. And then there's equally the other side of the people here in Seattle who love the winter because of the reading, the sitting around reading. I don't know if I've ever told you, but Seattle has a very popular event, a very popular monthly event, bi-monthly event, I'm not actually sure, where people pay money to go sit in the same room, the lobby of this hotel, and there are fires burning, and there's a man playing the piano, and you pay money to get a seat or to get a table in this area, and all you do is read. You don't even talk. You just maybe order a cocktail or a snack and you read while this man plays the piano. And it's so popular, Tiffany, that I have always wanted to go try it and I've never been able to get a ticket to it. That's how popular it is. No way. How expensive is, are we talking here? Uh, I mean, it can cost like, well, let me look it up. I mean, it's like $35 plus you have to buy a drink. Plus you have to buy a drink. Yep. See, I'd be like, for that price, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to bring my own flask of tea. Nope. And, and you're not going to bother me. Not allowed. Let's see. How much it costs depends on what kind of seat do you want. For instance, let's see. I'll, here's just an overview. $12 if you want to sit on a bar stool. That one, of course, sells out very quickly. Who wants to read on a bar stool? <laughs> this is your options. It's uh, not comfortable. <laughs> $18. $18 if you want to sit at a shared table. So that would mean you'd be sitting at a table with people you didn't know reading. Well, that's kind of nice. Yeah, but you're not talking. You're just reading, remember. I guess you can smile at each other across the table. Still, mm -hmm. you can make, yeah, you might meet your future spouse there. That's the hope. Shared interests <laughs> are important. I imagine that, yeah, that's the thing. They'll be like, oh, Camus, huh? Have you heard the quote about the uh, invincible summer? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> individual chair, $22. Chair by the fire, $35. Wait, individual chair. Wait, individual chair, does that mean... If you don't have an individual chair, you have someone else sitting on the same chair as you? No, I think this is a chair that's not sat at a table. <laughs> you just share a chair? Okay. I think this is so you don't have to look like it. You don't have to look awkwardly at people. So a chair by the fire, $35. And a love seat for two, fifty dollars And a table for three or four, $60. Okay, I have a couple of questions. My first question is, how long does this go on? Two hours and two hours. There's a twenty dollar food or drink minimum. I'm we gonna say like all day. Nope. Two hours, twenty dollar minimum drink okay. per person. And okay. After having talked to you several episodes ago about the Seattle Christmas market, <laughs> I'm gonna go out on a limb mm -hmm. and say that people in Seattle are looking for ways to throw their money away. Actively. Because I know not everybody has a fireplace, but I mean, can't you just do this just as easily at home and put on some music that's probably going to be better? I mean, I don't know what this guy's playing. Like that's, that's a big selling, a big selling point would be for me would be like, what music is, is happening here? Like, is he playing, is it like the guy at Nordstrom's who's just playing like the Andrew Lloyd Webber songbook? Is this real music? Like, are we going to get some Rachmaninoff uh, yes, WC. I can answer that question. He is a very good piano player. And I know that because I did go to the silent okay. reading party during the pandemic when it went online. And it was a lot cheaper, of course. Well, I would hope it was cheaper. I mean, man, I just can't believe how much. Okay. I think, see, if I lived in Seattle and I was a entrepreneurial sort, I would say, Katie, 
we got to go into business. We got to put these people out of business. We got to open a <laughs> library cafe bookshop, not even a bookshop. We don't even have to sell books and just offer the exact same thing, except it's every night. You have to get, get people to pay somehow. But I, I wouldn't go as far as to like be like, okay, this is how much it costs to sit. You just have to consume. And first come, first serve as far as, far as where you get to sit. If you get it there early, sure, you get the seat by the fire. Just like at any, mm -hmm. you know, bar mm -hmm. or something. I feel like we could clean up. I mean, if people are paying <laughs> just to sit and read, there's got to be some kind of uh, competition. You know, what's funny, though, is that I think that if you were to see the room where this takes place and hear the piano player, that this event would be like absolutely up your alley. I absolutely think it would be. I would never pay to do it, though. Yeah, it is expensive. But some bar out there that already exists that's, like, super cozy and super cute and fireplacey and all of that, that, like, they could do it once a week. You would think, yeah. These people need some competition. <laughs> Drive their prices down. My point, I guess my larger point, talking about seasons, is uh, that I don't know that I have a favorite season, per se, because I I get the, the coziness of the wet Seattle winter with the people wanting to read and the people wanting to go skiing, even though I myself pretty rarely go skiing. And I certainly love the spring and I love the summer. Um, but I don't know, like you, or I mean, even like Rome, it, the weather just doesn't swing that widely here. It's more like, is it raining or is it not mm -hmm. raining? And is it warmish or coldish? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Rome is also very, you know, it could be sunny all year round. It could be sunny on any given day of the year. It can be, you could expect there to be gorgeous sun shining. Not that there is every day, but it's possible every day. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like the seasons also have like a, a little bit of a personality. I mean, yes, it kind of goes with the weather, but it's also kind of based on the time of year it is. Like we were talking about last week, sort of, isn't March a better time of year to make new starts. I think also September is a great time of year mm -hmm. for a new start. I always get so industrious in September. It just so much reminds me of getting back to school and the feeling like there is a specific feeling and smell I feel like associated with back to school time. What your school books smell like when they're brand new and I don't know. There's just some something so exciting about that new beginnings. Like everything's fresh, clean slate. Yep. So I love September for that reason. Yeah. Beyond the weather. I love that time of year. Just a second to step aside and say that support for The Bittersweet Life comes from our listeners. Generous folks who believe that art, even art that is of an audio medium, has real entertainment value. That it's not easy, that it takes time. This week, I want to thank Miranda, Tom, and Veronica for being the most recent contributors over at patreon.com slash the bittersweet life podcast. And I also want to thank John, who after nearly 10 years of constant monthly support is passing that responsibility on to you. That's right. I'm talking to you, dear, wonderful listener who has thought about it, but never jumped on board to help support this show. For years, John and a handful of faithful others have kept this show going. We have relied on them, and they have allowed us to be here to this day. So if you believe that maybe it's your turn, or maybe you believe that artists actually deserve to be paid for their work, and this is a show you love, consider chipping in. There are links to donate in the show notes, or visit thebittersweetlife.net and click support. Yeah, I don't. Maybe it's just because it's been so mild this year that I I feel like I'm kind of on neutral. Like I've more been watching Action of the Birds. Or when I took a walk the other night, we have a a couple types of bushes that are native to the Seattle area that just smell like a lilac on steroids. They are they just smell amazing. And if you're walking through the dark every now and then, you just catch a whiff of it. And I've just been enjoying all that. And uh, much less conscious of the seasons, perhaps. One thing that's very common here in Seattle, and probably what keeps a lot of people from living here, is that you know people will tell you that they they don't prefer the sun. That if it's sunny for too long of a time, they get irritated. And I have definitely seen that to be true. 
because it's so rare, people feel like they have to be out doing something. And as a kind of a mole-like community, having to do something every day can be tiring. Mm -hmm. I did used to think, and we've talked about this, I'm sure, that I didn't really mind that it wasn't sunny most of the time until I moved to Rome and every day opened the heavy wooden shutters to the blazing, beautiful sun outside and thought, huh, maybe I do feel differently. Maybe this does affect me in ways that I don't really know. But then immediately I come back and I live in Seattle and I go, well, this is normal, you know? Well, I think that if you live in a place that is very, very often sunny, you have the luxury of being like, okay, I know it's a gorgeous day, but either A, I'm feeling lazy, I don't want to go out, or B, I have too much work to do, I need to stay in. Mm -hmm. Either one of those things, it's okay, because it's like, it'll probably be sunny again tomorrow. Or if not, it'll be sunny again the day after that. Yep. So I think that if you live in a place like Seattle or a place like London, yeah, you're like, I got to get out and enjoy this day because it might not happen for another month. So that's the nice thing about living in Italy. You don't feel that pressure mm -hmm. to get out and enjoy the sun. And I do think that the sun, the light, especially in the morning, the morning light, direct sun on your face is very good for your mood. It's very good for your energy levels. It's good for your sleep at night to have that in the morning. Um, but I do like every so often when it's beautiful weather for several days in a row, and then there's kind of a gray stormy day. I really enjoy it. Oh, good. We get to stay in, you know, we just stay in all weekend. How nice. We had a horrible, hor I mean, I say horrible, but it's, is it horrible or is it just different? Mm -hmm. um, we had what a lot of people would call horrible weather this weekend. And I mean, it rained pretty much all day on Saturday, hard. Sunday was sort of half and half. And today was weird. I was like, I don't think the weather knows what it's doing because it literally went from sun to pouring rain to sun to pouring rain to sun to pouring rain. It went back and forth and it rained so much today. I thought, I don't remember it raining like so much time. It has definitely rained this hard before or much harder, but so many hours. I've, you get that in Seattle, long hours and hours and hours and hours of rain, whereas in, in Rome, we don't get that. So, But nevertheless, I thought to myself, oh, goody, I don't have to feel guilty today that, that we're not out enjoying the sun. Like we can just spend four hours playing Monopoly, which we did on Saturday. <laughs> oh my gosh, Monopoly is long when you play with just two people. Uh, yes. um, but anyway, um, to you say know, the least. it's so. so long and just chill out. And that's what we did. And sometimes you need a weekend like that. But I suppose that if you have that every weekend, it gets a little bit tiresome. Well, you know, one thing I like about the weather as a thought to end is that regardless of what it is and what time of year it is, it's something that we really have no control over. Whatever it's going to be today is what it's going to be today. I find that kind of um, refreshing. It's like you said with your weekend. It's like, well, I guess we're staying in or I guess we're going to go out and play in the rain puddles. I don't know. You could easily do that. And I need to... <laughs> get over my bad framing of March. Just because I had a number of bad marches in a row with lots of rain, including the one time I came to Rome in March and it poured the whole time. <laughs> I need to get yeah. over get over my aversion to March or I need to start planning a really cool trip at every single March <laughs> to liven it up <laughs> and really just sort of, like you said, uh, kind of appreciate the subtle aspects in both places you and I live. There's this great app. It's definitely Japanese and it definitely has to do with seasons. This sort of traditional approach that they have in Japan, they have these very, very short seasons, these micro seasons that last about five or six days. Mm. And each one is a specific thing that is generally happening at that time. For example, the rivers begin to thaw. And like, that's the name of the season, translated into English, of course, or the first crocus is bloom. And there are these very, very specific things. And since Seattle has a very similar climate to Japan, it's a free app and you just download it and it has like a little image with every season and you can read about it, two or three paragraphs. It's a way of marking that moment on the calendar and making sure that the year doesn't run by. 
I think you would appreciate that app. I'll try to find it. And if I do, if it still exists, which it should, because I had it until about six months ago, I will put it, it in our show notes. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. If I had to say, what is the season of today? Just by looking out of my window, which I can look out a window while I'm talking to you. Long-time listeners to the show will know I have a bird feeder that is stuck to my window and the birds just hang out in it. It is currently not raining. If it is raining, sometimes there are a few that are just sitting in it like it's a little, you know, bus shelter and they're staying out of the rain for a minute. But today was the day when a flicker came and landed on that feeder for the first time. And for those of you who don't know, a flicker is a gigantic woodpecker that is all oh. around Seattle. It looked at me through the glass and saw me looking at it. And we both gave each other a kind of a, an alarmed expression. And then it flew off. And so today is the day of the alarmed flicker, weather-wise. I love that. I've never heard of a flicker, but I'm happy to have heard of it. And for you, what was your Rome day today, your Rome season today, the day of the uh, the pounding rains? Or what would you say? The weather that didn't know what it was supposed to be. Rain, then sun, then rain, then sun, then rain, then sun, then rain again. Indeterminate weather day. It was a lot. It was an intense day. Very nice. Mm -hmm. I like it. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for listening to the show, telling a friend about it. If you've never told a friend about it, uh, just do that as a favor to us. And we a favor to your friend, quite frankly. Yeah, no kidding, right? And of course, you can <laughs> always find us on social media. Just look for the Bittersweet Life podcast and you will find us. And until next time, this is the Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. Join us again. Bye. The Bittersweet Life is produced and edited by me, Katie Sewell. My co-host is Tiffany Parks. If Rome is in your travel plans, be sure to arrange a historical tour with Tiffany. To set it up, send us a note through the Contact Us page at thebittersweetlife.net. Also, you could sponsor this show and reach thousands of engaged thinkers and travel lovers all over the world. Send us a note at thebittersweetlife.net to get the conversation started. Our logo is designed by Jody Rick at the Lost Laboratory, web help from Drew Atkins. And this show continues when listeners support it. Tell a friend to subscribe, write us a review, and like you would with any other art you appreciate, tip your podcaster. Don't steal the tea. Find ways to toss a donation in the hat at thebittersweetlife.net. Thank you.